Hello POS 201 students, this is your video lecture on John Locke. Uh, John, oh, and uh, as always, you should probably uh, do the, you should, you should definitely do the reading first uh, because this is meant to highlight some things from the reading, but it doesn't cover everything. Um, John Locke is very important to the founding of the American Republic. He's often considered the grandfather of the American Constitution. A lot of his uh, writings and ideas go directly into the, both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. In fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, um, almost plagiarized uh, sayings uh, from the writings of John Locke. For instance, John Locke said, life, liberty, and property. Uh, and as you know, Thomas Jefferson wrote, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right, so let's get started. All right, so uh, like Hobbes, uh, which you'll learn about later, or perhaps you've already watched that lecture, um, he does a thought experiment where he imagines human beings back before uh, civilization, before civil society, before the creation of governments, so human beings living in nature, uh, he called that the state of nature. Uh, contrasting with Hobbes, Hobbes had a very pessimistic look at human beings in the state of nature, said it was all at war of every man against every man. Well, um, Locke has a much more optimistic viewpoint that we had a natural civilization about it, we were naturally civilized. Uh, here's a good quote from him. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges, obliges everyone and reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So basically, there's a law of nature that we, as human beings, with our reason, can uh, uh, figure out. And if we properly use our reason, it defines for us what is right and wrong. All right. So, unlike Hobbes, he sees the problems in the state of nature is not that we're, it's all out warfare, uh, that people who properly use their reason uh, are peaceful towards others, they don't steal or harm them. Uh, the problem is for those people who don't properly use their reason and do uh, trend, trend, transgress up against other people. Uh, and so those transgressions, uh, the penalties and punishments are given out to any man to dole out. So it's, 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 so you basically in the state of nature you have, your right, you have the right to private judgment. Uh, so primitive community law, transgressions judged by the injured party. So let's say I you know, steal your iPhone. In this, according to this state of nature, uh, there's no police or government apparatus to turn to to adjudicate or resolve the, the the fact that I just stole property from you. It's up to yourself to try to resolve it. And if you're a weaker party than me, uh, then there's nothing you can really do. If you're a stronger party, then maybe you can get it back. Or the, what he argues the problem is the uh, the punishment can go beyond the initial transgression. So let's say I steal your iPhone and then you kill me as a result to get your iPhone back. That's what he argues is the problem in the state of nature is that private judgment of transgressions, you, the injured party, decides the punishment and if you can enact some sort of punishment, that punishment goes beyond the initial transgression, it goes too far. And that's not fair, that's not just. <clears throat> Uh, some say this reflects current uh, international relations. So, for instance, uh, you know, the United Nations, kind of a weak global governance, weak body um, in terms of mitigating problems between nation states. So, you know, it's up to nation states to sort of adjudicate and decide things. So, um, you know, Russia invades, you know, uh, the Crimea. Um, not much can be re can really be done about that, and so what? Uh, uh, or you know, if the United States decided to retaliate for that with a nuclear strike, that would be you know going beyond because there's no you know higher authority to adjudicate these problems. Therefore, in the case of Ukraine, they're too weak to uh, deal with the invade the Russian invasion uh, of Crimea and the takeover. Uh, on the other side, if we were to launch a massive invasion against Russia or something, you know, that, that also goes too far. 
<clears throat> so the problem is enforcement, but also enforcement going beyond the initial transgression. Alright, so uh, Locke also talks about the state of war, which is something Hobbes talked about. For Hobbes, the state of war and the state of nature were the same. You know, it was a lawless anarchy, every man out for himself. Uh, the way Locke defines, defines the state of war is that when a person tries to put another in slavery or absolute power over him. <clears throat> so an absolute authority can do with a man as he pleases, compel him to do something against his freedom. Uh, such an absolute authority can take away possessions by force. And so such a person is an aggressor and must be resisted. So the contrast with Hobbes you probably should also watch the Hobbesian lecture uh, just so you get a better sense of what uh, what Locke here is arguing against is that when a sovereign authority comes in and you know commands you and takes over this creates a state of war because man's natural state is liberty freedom and so such a person must be resisted and the reason is is basically Locke argues that human beings are endowed with uh, certain natural rights, life, liberty, and property. And no one sh is, should be allowed to arbitrarily take any of those things from you. All right, so back to the, the, to the uh, state of nature. Uh, it's not sufficiently clear. Men are biased towards their own interests and the, or the interests of their friends. And so if there's a transgression, there's, you know, you're the injured party or you're one of your friends is the injured party, you're obviously going to be biased towards them. And so what we really need is a third-party judge who has no personal stake in the matter. So, uh, and the injured party in the state of nature, like I said, is not always strong enough to execute a just sentence. And men are sometimes ruled by their passions. They don't always use their reason. And so revenge, when I seek revenge and apply a disproportionate judgment to the crime. Like my iPhone example, you, I, you kill me because I stole your iPhone. <clears throat> so what... Uh, Locke argues is that the purpose of government, the purpose of, social, of the social contract, the social contract is the idea that you form a contract between the people and government about how you're going to be ruled, like a constitution basically. And the purpose of a social contract according to Locke is to establish organized law and order to eliminate these previous deficiencies. So now if I steal your iPhone, you go to the police, it's adjudicated in a court, uh, the laws and punishments apply equally to everyone, no matter who they are, and it, so it creates basically rule of law. All right. Uh, so you need rational rule of law with impartial adjudication. So that's you know why we have, if you go on trial, you have a, a jury of your peers who are supposed to be impartial and biased, and you have a judge that's supposed to be the same, uh, and everything is determined by rational, written down laws and apply equally to everyone. So, and this creates civil society, which has many advantages over the state of nature. If we're living according to laws and have a, a judicial branch to turn to when laws and transgressions are made, then, you know, it, 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 it eliminates those uh, deficiencies in the primitive community law that we were just talking about. And then there's a de definition of rule of law, settled standing rules that are indifferent and same to all parties. So we give up our power of private judgment and entrust it to a government authority to act as a third party arbitrator when we have disputes with our fellow human beings. And Locke put a lot of, pres a lot of emphasis on civil society must protect property, people's property, because a property, property is the fruits, is something they've earned through the fruits of their labor, and that is something that must be protected. Okay, so what's the role of government in civil society? Um, let's see. So unlike Hobbes, we don't give up our freedom to uh, one man or an absolute authority. Rather, we entrust it to some sort of civil authority. And he, he kind of uses the example of an economic pact. So for instance, you have a trust. So you know what a trust is? A trust is a big pile of money, all right? And a trustee is the person who looks out for that money, makes sure it grows, it's not embezzled or lost or anything like that. So he guards the money, looks out for it. The beneficiary is the person who, when they come of age or whatever, receives that money. He argues that this is how uh, 
government should be uh, constructed. We, the people, uh, and, and this is the beginning of the idea of that government comes from rule and consent of the people. We, the people, are both the trust and the beneficiary. All right, so we're the big pile of money, and we're the ones who benefit. Um, and we entrust a legislature as a trustee to administer on our behalf and to our benefit. And so it put emphasis. So Locke puts emphasis not on executive authority like Hobbes did, but on legislative authority. So a body of people that we elect to represent our interests, uh, to work to our benefit, and to safeguard our our trust, us safeguard us. <clears throat> Yeah, so he, he thinks the legislature is what should be the supreme uh, governmental authority over uh, other government authorities, but ultimately subordinated to us, the people. And so this is the beginning of the idea that legitimacy of rule is derived by the people. Contrast this with Locke, who argued that legitimacy comes from entrusting a monopoly on the use of force to some sort of uh, you know higher sovereign or, or king or whatever. Locke is saying, no, it's us, the people, that give legitimacy. Uh, let's see. So the legislators, servant of people, we have the right to remove them. When they fail in their duties and obligations, you know, vote. Uh, the people have rights. The government only has duties. So basically what Locke argues is our natural rights. We have a right to life. We have a right to liberty, to, to pursue those things that we desire, as long as we do no harm to others. And we have a right to the uh, fruits of our own labor, property, all right? Uh, these rights precede government. So therefore, government's sole job, its only duty, is to protect our natural rights. So we, we have those rights, they're ours, before the creation of civil society, before the creation of government. And so the only purpose of government, therefore, is to protect those rights. <clears throat> yeah, so government only has the responsibility of upholding our rights. And so if you think about our Bill of Rights, that's exactly what it is. The Bill of Rights is a restriction on, it basically says, government cannot impede on these rights that we've enumerated in the Bill of Rights. All right. So, uh, we've already talked about Hobbes. Um, yep, we talked about that. There are natural rights that precede government, primary which is property. And so basically men give up the state of nature for the mutual preservation of their lives and liberties and estates which I call by the general name property. So government's sole purpose is to protect those basic civil liberties, those natural rights. Okay, so there you go. Life, liberty, property. Thomas Jefferson changed to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and we'll perhaps talk in class uh, why Jefferson made the change to uh, pursuit of happiness. Maybe think about that a little bit. And so Locke forms the basis of what we call classical liberalism. So classical liberalism is the idea that, and this is in contrast with Hobbes and Machiavelli, who you'll learn about also, uh, they were considered classical realists, uh, who had a very pessimistic, and everyone's a selfish, self-interested bastard out for themselves. Classical liberalism is kind of the flip side, kind of the, the more optimistic viewpoint that natural rights are, that we have a natural moral sense we have natural rights that are inherent to us as human beings. The state of nature is not this anarchic, warlike uh, world. Um, and human actions are governed by these laws of nature that we can discern with our reason. And it leads us to a natural sense of morality. And Locke has a inf heavy influence upon the founding generation. Like I said, we already see the influence in the Declaration of Independence, the idea Locke Brett talks about separation of power, checks and balances, all that went into our own system of government. The Bill of Rights is a list of enumerated civil liberties that government is not allowed to infringe upon. And so Locke has the biggest influence on modern American political thought. So, uh, let's 